And praise the Lord. Thank you, Susan and Abigail. If you would, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. Hebrews chapter 12. The sermon this morning is titled, No Matter What. No Matter What. Before I begin this morning, as we've been praying about, and uh, I don't think there's anyone with a television set or a radio or a smartphone that's not aware that we live in some sad and troubling times as far as this nation. Um, Susan just read for us, and I'm just going to read again real quickly, Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And Proverbs 14, 34, which you all are familiar with, tells us that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Having read those verses, I have two quotes I want to share. I've shared them here before. I often come back to them in my mind when I think about our nation. And though opinions may vary about our formation, and, and, the, and the opinions vary widely, I do know that we've been a blessed nation. And I know to the best of their ability that many of our founders did believe that they, with their utmost ability, that they were obeying God. Our second and third presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, said some things that, again, I come back to often. And John Adams said this, We have no government armed with power, capable of contending with human passions, if they be unbridled by morality and religion. And make no mistake, by religion, he meant that of the Christian faith. When they were concerned about oppression from one sect of religion to another, they meant within the varying denominations of Christendom. But again, I start that again. He says, we have no government. The government that they had set about to form that was armed with power that would be capable of contending with human, humans' passions if those passions were unbridled by, by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a well goes through a net. Listen to these la this last little thing he says here in this sh short quote. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. What he is saying is that once we as a people abandon what many consider the restraints of walking before God, of fearing God, of loving God, that our constitution would fail. If you wonder how we could be in a place where not that long ago, what is often referred to as the greatest generation of our culture would fight against communism, would fight against those that were being oppressed by a Nazi regime that had given their lives to less than 100 years later be in a position where we would be this close to electing those that would want to institute the very same form of government that had oppressed so many? It's because once you remove God from the equation, it's a very slippery slope and anything is possible. To give you the second quote this morning from Thomas Jefferson, and again, there are those that would say that he was not a Christian, but I encourage you to do your homework and you would quickly see that though he had some concern about much of organized religion and some of the abuses, he very much delighted in the person of Jesus. And he said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure 
when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. For as much as we are to pursue peace, I do believe those words that his justice cannot sleep forever and no nation can continue to perpetuate, to perpetuate ungodliness and sin and not expect to be given over to the ramifications of the, that life. I had asked you this morning to turn to Hebrews 12. So I ask you now to pick up in verse 1 with me. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. I had Susan and Abigail read a couple of psalms this morning that deal with God's own heart and mind towards those nations that would rebel against Him and those that would continue to trust Him and recognize, guys, that He can be trusted and that we would be full-hearted to put our trust in any other apart from Him. When I think about Psalm 33 this morning, it doesn't say those that trust Him won't experience hard times. It doesn't say that they won't experience famine. It says that through those things He will sustain them. Again, Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1 this morning, it says this, Therefore, and we'll come back to that therefore, for he's saying therefore for all the things that he just written in his letter to the Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. Now he is seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. Think about all he endured when sinful people did such terrible things to him so that you don't become weary and give up. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you entirely forgotten the encouraging, the encouraging words that God has spoken to you? His children? He said, my child... Don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you, and don't be discouraged when He corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those He loves, and He punishes those He accepts as His children. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as His own children. Whoever heard of a child who has never been disciplined? If God doesn't discipline you as He does all of His children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children after all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we not all the more cheerfully submit to the discipline of our heavenly Father and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means we will share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful, but afterward there will be a quiet harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and stand firm on your shaky legs. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. The King James says they'll be healed. Try to live in peace with everyone and seek to live a clean and holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you will miss out on the special favor of God. Watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among you. For whenever it springs up, many are corrupted by its poison. And make sure that no one is immoral 
are godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the oldest son for a single meal. And afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he wept bitter tears. Now, I think it's safe to say that there's a little bit of confusion and maybe some lack of clarity about what it means to be under the discipline of the Lord. Because of that, I want to back up just a little bit, give a little bit of the bigger picture of, at least in context here under the Hebrews, what this meant for them. <clears throat> if you'll turn back just momentarily, we're going to read some of Hebrews chapter 10. So Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. The writer of Hebrews says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly, because of what Christ has done for us, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of His death for us. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's people, let us go right into the presence of God with true hearts fully trusting Him. For our evil consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Without wavering, let us boldly, oh, excuse me, let us hold tightly to the hope we say we have. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. Think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of His coming back again is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received a full knowledge of the truth, there is no other sacrifice that will cover these sins. There will be nothing to look forward to but the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. Anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Think how much more terrible the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant as if it were common and unholy. Such people have insulted and enraged the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to His people. For we know the one who said, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it. He also said, the Lord will judge His own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't ever forget those early days when you first learned about Christ. So we learned something in these Hebrews who had come to Christ. Are y'all with me? I know this is a lot of reading. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped, you, you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew you had better things waiting for you in eternity. Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. No matter what happens, Everybody say, no matter what. No matter what. Quick pause. These Hebrews, enduring those things which they were enduring at the hands of their government, at the hands of fellow citizens, endured it with joy, suffering the loss of everything they owned. And he said in verse 35, do not throw away this confident trust. They did it because they knew that something better awaited after this life in the now. Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord, no matter what happens. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now, so you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And the righteous person will live by faith. But I will have no pleasure in anyone who turns away, saith God, 
And the writer of Hebrews says, but we are not like those who turn their backs on God and seal their fate. For we have faith that assures our salvation. And he says, what is faith, you ask? It is a confident assurance of those things that we hope for, that they will happen. It is the evidence of things that we cannot yet see, and yet God gave his approval to people in the days of old because of their faith. And he goes on, we don't have time to read all of this, but he says, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, and that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel. It was by faith that Enoch, it was by faith that Noah, it was by faith that Abraham, it was by faith that Sarah, it was by faith that Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, when he grew up, refused to be treated as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. I pause again a moment this morning as I had a short conversation with Michael yesterday. What things in our near future might we not be able to partake of to be able to enjoy the short comforts and pleasures that our culture offers for that which is greater the reward of Christ and being a part of his kingdom Moses thought it better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah than to own the treasures of Egypt for he was looking ahead to the great reward that God would give him we see Israel in faith crossing the Red Sea we see Israel surrounding Jericho and marching around it at the command of God and seeing Jericho fall. We read in verse 32 of chapter 11, Well, how much more do I need to say, says the writer? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the flames of fire, and they escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death, and at that we could stop and we would all say amen, and that's the type of victory that we want. But the writer goes on and he says, but, oh, that word but, but others. Others' victories didn't look like that, but it was victory nonetheless. But others trusted God and were tortured, preferring to die rather than to turn from God and be free. They placed their hope in the resurrection to a better life. Some were mocked, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in dungeons. Some died by stoning, and some were sawn in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about in the skins of sheep and goats, hungry and oppressed and mistreated. But what does the writer say? They were too good for this world. They wandered over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Those that the world would despise and jeer and laugh and mock and ridicule. And yet God Almighty looks and says, the world is not worthy of these. The writer goes, all of these people we have mentioned received God's approval because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had far better things in mind for us that would also benefit them. For they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish ours. There's so much that could be impact. I mean, that's a lot of scripture. A few things that I just want to emphasize to you this morning. Number one, when I think about this word discipline, as we see it in Scripture and used elsewhere, we came across it in Hebrews 12. In the King James, it's, it uses the word chastise or chastisement. <clears throat> it carries the meaning to train children over and over. It, it has to do with teaching. When you think about disciplining your children, your discipline can mean correction. It can mean physical correction. But often it means the type of discipline that comes with, no, you, you can't have that yet. First, you need to eat this, and here's why. Teaching, instruction. <clears throat> it can be by correcting with words, reproving, or admonishing. We see it used in Acts 7.22, 22.3, Titus 2.12. And of course here, the writer in Hebrews is directly quoting Proverbs 3, 11, 12, where Solomon writes, My child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you. 
And don't be discouraged when He corrects you. For the Lord corrects those He loves just as the Father corrects a child in whom He delights. But it does carry the weight of infliction of evils or calamities in 1 Corinthians 11.32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. The reason I read this is that in context, whatever you may think a disciplined Lord means, it at least means in context here that God can allow His children to forego suffering to the end that He is more concerned about you being set apart unto Him in holiness than He is about our present comfort. And if it takes those distresses to put us in a place of dependence upon Him, He will allow those things to happen. And I don't think at a stretch of the imagination or that we have to look far to be in agreement sitting here in this room this morning to say that there's much of the church or those that profess to know Jesus that the life that they walk is not one of holiness and the church looks a mess. I think we could agree upon that. And so if it takes a shaking because judgment begins in the house of God, then let it be shaken. We pursue peace and we're not chasing trouble, but when trouble comes, we bear up under it because our trust and our hope was never in those things to begin with. It was in the person of Jesus and those things that we've been promised hereafter. God will and does allow suffering to the end that His children will be holy. Verse 10 of chapter 12 says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. I believe in the King James, I'd have to look back, but even for their own benefit, their own comfort. I love my children. I discipline for their benefit, but I also discipline for my own. Because when I want a quiet home, I want a quiet home. I want there to be peace. It's as much for my benefit as for theirs. When God disciplines, when He trains, when He instructs, He is doing it for our benefit because He knows there's life in it even if we don't see it. He goes on, but God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means we will share in His holiness. Again, so I asked the question this morning, is God more concerned about His children's comfort or their holiness? And the resounding answer is He is concerned about your holiness. Have you ever noticed, maybe you've even experienced, if any of you ever walked in any amount of rebellion, uh, we've all been going through a process of sharing our testimonies on Sunday mornings of the first Sunday of the month. And you heard in mind that though I had come to the Lord early in my childhood and I had a very real taste of who He was and His goodness, in my young teenage years I began to walk away from Him and rebel. And the one thing I found in my rebellion, having become His child, was this. Is that He never seemed to let me get away with the things that I could watch my peers around me get away with. There was always immediate trouble. Now maybe that's not your experience, but it was mine. Just uh, I'm going to share a brief story, and it's not to glory in sin. It's just to show you how I had this in my mind that I knew the Lord did not allow me to get away with things that He allowed others to get away with. I had maybe driven drunk once or twice before I got a DWI. My experience of driving around intoxicated was very short-lived. I knew people who had driven drunk over and over and over and not been caught, not suffered any ramifications. Matter of fact, not only had they driven drunk, but it was one of their greatest pleasures and pastimes was to go buy a case of beer and go drive around. Second or third time I'd ever done it, I was pulled over and thrown in jail for the night. Didn't learn my lesson. And so for the next year, I suffered the consequences of that, not having a driver's license. And despite the fact that I didn't have a license, I was gathered together with some friends and we were drinking and one of the friends got a phone call from a girl and there was this big party going on in Fort Worth at, near the TCU campus and we'd been invited. And they all wanted to go, but we'd all been drinking and I'd had a little less to drink than the rest. And so they were begging me to drive. Jason, you, you're, you always get to be the one that drinks, but we need someone who has to stay sober and doesn't drink when we go. So, 
well, that's not me. I don't have a driver's license. Oh, nothing's going to happen. You can drive. I said, no, I'm not doing it. I said, I don't have a license. I've already started drinking. No, I'm going to drink. No, da, da, da. and he just kept on and kept on. And finally, I was like, just relentless. And I was like, okay, I'll drive, but I'm warning you, something bad's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. I said, you don't understand. I understand who, I understood who God was in my life and I knew he wasn't going to let me get away with it. So I cut myself off from the alcohol. I agree to drive. We drive to Fort Worth from Burleson. We get there. The party is not all that cracking like they hoped it would be. It's pretty lame as a matter of fact, as far as those types of things go. So we get back in the truck and as we're leaving, going down Berry Street, it's a two or three, I think you got two lanes headed towards I-35 going with us, two lanes on the other side, and then a turn lane for traffic. We're just approaching the bridge where we're going to make a right and get on the on-ramp. Over to our left, there are a couple cop cars with their flashers on that have someone pull over. Something's happened. I'm still slightly buzzing. I've come off the alcohol that I had some hours ago. I'm approaching the red light, and I watch a car swerve. She's coming over the bridge, the overpass. Swerve from two lanes over, no blinker. Swerve, come through the red light, coming head on at me. Cops right over here. I'm immediately, even in my inebriated state, Lord, I knew I wouldn't get away with this. What am I doing? I throw his truck in reverse. I can see her coming. I hit the gas. I'm trying to back up. Tires are peeling. Cops to the side. Tires squawking. And despite my effort to get away, she still hits us head on. I jump out of the truck. I said, I'm done. I'm not driving anymore. Do what you want. So one of the, my friends who had had too much to drink to begin with gets in the driver's seat. I get in the back seat. Despite all that's going on, the cops don't come over. The lady proceeds to pull down the street. I said, let's get out of here. Let's go home. No, we need to tell this lady what's happened. We need to give her a piece of our mind. I said, you're making a mistake. Let's go. We watch her run into a brick wall in her car, proceed to back up, continue to drive down a back alley. We follow her down said alley. I'm begging my friends to leave. They won't listen to me. She gets out of the car. She's got her hands up her shirt. She comes to our car. You boys better get out of here. The police is on their way. And I'm like, guys, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You guys better get out of here. The police. And she just keeps repeating that. I'm like, said, let's go. <coughs> so they put it in reverse. We leave. We watch her get in her car, hit another building. But because of our sinful state, we can't do the right thing lest we get in trouble. We can't call the police to warn them of her driving to protect other people. And we drive home and it's the end of the night. Now you may say, how'd you get, well, I didn't get in trouble, but I knew the Lord wasn't going to allow me to continue in my sin and get away with things. Something's going to happen. We go home with a wrecked truck because the Lord wasn't going to allow me to continue. And there were so many things like that in that season that I could point out. Should it come as any surprise in our culture when we're reaping the fruits of those things which we've sown? For as much as I hope for peace and justice to prevail and still hope for a miracle, if we descend in the direction that it would appear that we're headed, I'm very thankful my hope is not in my government but in what God can do in the midst of this chaos is he can use it to call people to repentance because he delights more in his children's holiness than he does in their comfort. And if all we're concerned about is our comfort and prosperity in the, cult, in the culture that we live in, we've missed the boat. <laughs> America's hands are stained with blood and God is not ignorant of it. He's not shut his eyes to it. God is serious about our being set apart from the world. I just want to point out this morning that whatever happens, if I believe that he can use what's happening to chastise and discipline his children. And just like Romans 12 says, it can work to their advantage. And so I want you to take hope in that, that there's a bigger picture and we don't have to lose hope. It's all good. Despite the famine that I pray does not happen, but if it does, who is our God? He's the God that delivers his children through the famine. 
It may not look like what we had hoped, but he still sustains us. No matter what, I want you to cling to your God. And there's a warning, and I think many of us have experienced this and witnessed those around us that go through this. He warns the Hebrews in chapter 12 and verses 14 and 15, and I warn you here and encourage you not to let what goes on around you to allow you to become bitter when things go south. In verse 14 and 15, the writer says, try to live at peace with everyone. Guys, despite the decisions, despite things that fly contrary to our sensibilities, to our God, we are going to make every effort to live at peace with everyone. And we're going to seek to live a clean and holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Listen to this. Look after each other so that none of you will miss out on the special favor of God. And then he warns them, watch out that no bitter root of unbelief rises up among you. For whenever it springs up, many are corrupted by its poison. Anyone here know anyone that knows the Lord that has had bitterness spring up? I know someone. A word of wisdom. God has not given you a spirit of fear, and He's sure not given you a spirit of bitterness. If the things and the witnesses and the voices that you are surrounding yourself with are producing those things, you need to cut them out of your life. Steve shared a story of years ago that as Christians, we've not been called to be ignorant. I'm not telling anyone here to be ignorant. And he said, and I would not wanting to be ignorant and wanting to be up on what's going on in the world. I would read the news, listen to the news. But what Steve had found it was producing in him as a young man was his bitterness, fear, anger. And so he said, I had to cut it out because it was not producing the things that the Lord wanted to produce in me. You need to take whatever measure necessary If there is something producing bitterness in you, God is saying cut it off because it's dangerous. Rather, you need to find people around you that will encourage you. There is something bigger than what's happening out there going on. Too many people are trying to hold on to a kingdom that we have already been promised will not last. It will not last. As much as I would like it to, America is in the winter of her power and position. The same young man that enticed me to drive the truck that night so many years ago nearly came to throwing fists when I told him that America would not always be on top. I wasn't trying to be ugly. He got irate with me for saying that. I thought, how ignorant are you? He said, America's always been on top and she'll always be on top. I thought, America has not always even existed. What are you talking about? Have you not read a history book? Are you crazy? I said, I'm not saying I want that to happen. I love my nation. I I love how God has blessed us. But history speaks another story. Don't let bitterness beset you. Max Lucado shares a story of running a half iron man triathlon he says after the 1.2 mile swim in the 56 mile bike ride i didn't have much energy left for the 13.1 mile run neither did the fellow jogging next to me i asked him how he was doing and soon regretted posing the question this stinks the guy said this race is the dumbest decision i've ever made he had more complaints than a taxpayer at the irs My response to him, goodbye. I knew if I listened long enough, I'd start agreeing with him. I caught up with a 66-year-old grandmother. Her tone was just the opposite. You'll, excuse me, you will finish this, she said. It's hot, but at least it's not raining. One step at a time. Don't forget to hydrate. Stay in there. I ran next to her until my little heart, my heart lifted and my legs were aching. I finally had to slow down, and she waved and passed me by. 
And he asked, which of the two companions' counsel do you seek? Be the one to others that you desire for yourself. And that's what the writer of Hebrews here tells us to be to each other. That we're to encourage and to look after one another. To encourage each other to cling to God, to His promises, to what we know He has said in His Word. This is not something that I had drawn forth as far as to make a point this morning, but as I read this and was thinking about it, even as I drove in, I just want to say this, that the analogy that the writer of Hebrews used here is that of a race. And we, he, you know, he uses the verbiage, he says, that if there's anything that entangles or ensnares to set it aside, especially that sin which so easily weighs us down and besets us, to cut it off. And I like that vernacular. I like the fact that he chose a race. And when I came across this Max Licato story, how funny that the guy would say, this is the worst decision of my life. I don't know why I signed up for this thing. It saddens me that so many people don't know why they signed up to experience life in Christ. Part of it, the church is guilty because of the message that we've preached. We have not told them the race that they've signed up for. We've promised them a walkathon and they've entered a triathlon. <laughs> we've promised them a day at the mall walking with the elderly where there'll be slurpees at the end, but rather it's an obstacle course where you'll be muddy, wet, cold, and people will pass you by and, per and perhaps kick mud in your face. We need to be speaking the truth and telling people what they're signing up for when they sign up. Jesus said to count the cost so that the writer of Hebrews could write and say, you know why you've entered this. You know why you endured those afflictions at the beginning. You know why you started this race. It's because of the person of Jesus and what he's done. That's why we don't lose hope. He is the beginning and the end, the author and the perfecter. The only reason, the, the thing that we set our sights to, when things get difficult, we look to the person of Jesus who endured the shame that he endured. Why? For that which was set before him. Think about what he endured. Was it honor? Was it glory? No, the world despised him. They spit upon him. They slapped him. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Why? For the joy set before him. He was doing something that had value and he recognized it. Despite the world not seeing it, he was redeeming you and me. And them out there. And to himself. And it was that road of shame that it took to get to that point. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he says in the spiritual, we're already seated there with him. Do you recognize it? Do you see it? I just want to encourage you this morning, whatever is to come, to recognize that our God is, and I know you've heard this, I know you believe this, I know you know this, He's still in control. I can't speak to some of the things that some of the prophets have prophesied during this season. What I can say is when the going gets tough, my God is still in control. And He said that He would sustain me through those tough times. And He would even draw me closer unto himself. And there would even be benefit for me in those hard times because I would learn to trust him more and that is of great benefit. So I encourage you this morning to look after one another, to cling to your God no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Don't let bitterness set in. They've taken everything. Don't let bitterness set in. It's nothing, no matter what. Heavenly Father, we just bless you in this place, Lord. I just pray that your grace, Lord, will produce thanksgiving in your children. It doesn't mean that we don't cry out for justice. It doesn't mean we delight in injustice. But we know that you are just and vengeance belongs to you, Lord. No matter how the heathen rage, Father, those that would reject you. There is a coming day of judgment, Father, and we can trust you in that. No matter what the world does, Lord, we can delight in your forgiveness unto us and the forgiveness that is offered unto them, Father, if they would but receive it. 
And I pray against a spirit of bitterness, Lord, that would try to set upon and thwart your children, Lord, anywhere they are, even today, even now, Lord. Bitterness be gone in the name of Jesus. And love and holiness and thankfulness, Lord, and righteousness be established in your children. That like Peter, Lord, when he writes, when the world beholds us, Lord, in the midst of trouble, they would say, where does this joy come from? How do you have hope in the midst of such evil? Because my hope was never in this kingdom to begin with, but in another. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.